The growth of God's kingdom involves work. Although the power for every kind of growth in the kingdom is accomplished through the gospel of the kingdom, as we've seen other times during the course of this study. But we do know, though, that God uses people in his work. And we've seen that even in the last couple of lessons as we've looked at the personal disciplines that are involved in kingdom growth. So God does use people, and now as we add to that, we recognize that to help his kingdom grow, God has given a variety of roles people will fill. Let's consider Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 11 through 16. It says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning, with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. So you notice in this passage, notice that when all these functions, all these roles, as they have been designed, when all of them are working, the result is the maturation of the body of Christ. The result is the protection against false teaching. And the result is the continual growth of the body. And therefore, we need to consider the six roles that are identified in this text. And we want to begin to do that here in this first lesson. Let's begin, as the text does, thinking about the role of apostles. You know, the term apostle simply refers to one who is sent out with orders on a mission. Now, there are times when this word is used in a general sense, we might say. Acts chapter 14 and verse 14 includes Barnabas um, in talking about him as an apostle, as well as uh, Saul, I believe, or Paul in that text. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1 even refers to Jesus as the apostle and high priest of our confession. Again, the idea is that this is one who's sent forth, one who's sent out with orders on a mission. So we can see it used sometimes in just a general way, but the word is primarily used in the scriptures concerning the ones who were directly selected and sent out by Jesus. Now, of course, when we think about who were apostles in this kind of very specific sense, these included the original 12 apostles, Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And so sometimes you would just have references to the 12 so clearly these 12 were selected in a different way than other disciples were. So we have the, the original 12 that are listed here in Matthew chapter 10, but then we also find that Matthias is included later into this group that's called the apostles, this specific group, Acts chapter 1 verses 23 through 26. Remember, Judas killed himself, and so now there are just 11. It says, so they proposed to Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, you, Lord, know everyone's hearts. Show which of these two you have chosen 
to take the place in this apostolic ministry that Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. And so we can recognize that Matthias is added to this group, because we had twelve, and now minus Judas leaves us with eleven, and Matthias is added to that group um, who are called apostles. And finally, we can also see Paul was added to this group. Acts 26, verses 15 through 28, you can go and read through the whole text um, in, in that particular place. Galatians chapter 1, Paul says in verses 1 and 2, Paul, an apostle, not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So Paul introduces his apostleship here to the Galatian Christians, showing that it's, it's not just some dictate that was decided by a person, but that this is something that comes from God. This is something that comes from Jesus. Now, so we, we recognize we got 14 in total who have ever held that particular office, if you will, this particular role or function in this specific sense of the term apostle. When Matthias was being chosen to replace Judas as an apostle, we can notice two things. Let's go back just a couple verses from what we read a, a moment ago. Acts chapter 1, verses 21 and 22 now. Therefore, from among the men who have accompanied us during the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, from among these it is necessary that one become a witness with us of his resurrection. So I want you to notice before Matthias has added a couple of things from this passage. First, I want you to notice that not everyone who followed Jesus was sent out in the role as an apostle. Okay, there were others who were here, even, even gathered in this room, this upper room, and, but not all were called apostles. Not all were selected to, to fill this vacancy, if you will. Only Matthias was. Second, there were specific requirements sought in those who would be sent out as apostles, including that they would be a witness of Jesus' resurrection. Well, furthermore, the apostles, as we keep looking in scriptures, we see that the apostles would be able to perform true miraculous signs. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 12, Paul mentions the signs of an apostle were performed with unfailing endurance among you, including signs and wonders and miracles. So there were certain things that apostles were able to do, and we can see that throughout the book of Acts. And this would work to confirm the word that was spoken. That was really their, one of their main points. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 shows that as well. So when you step back and we, we understand now, hopefully, the specific way that the word apostle is used in scriptures, and that there have only been 14 men who have ever filled that role, well, these would play a critical role in the growth of the kingdom in the New Testament times particularly as we see them serving as proclaimers of the gospel as eyewitnesses to the resurrected Christ. You know, they were going all over the world, and they were proclaiming salvation in Jesus, and they were saying, we have seen Jesus risen from the dead. Prior to Jesus' ascension, he identified how he would use the apostles in a key way to spread his gospel of salvation throughout the world. In Matthew 28, of course, with the Great Commission, specifically given to the apostles, they were going to play a key role in what he wanted to have accomplished in the Great Commission. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am, always, I am with you always to the end of the age. So they, they were to play a key role in taking the message of the gospel out into the world. Acts chapter 1, 
we see more about this in verses 4 through 8. While he, that's Jesus, was with them, the apostles, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which, he said, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So they were to wait in Jerusalem for a time, but they weren't just to stay there. In fact, they were to then spread the gospel in these various places and how it would start in Jerusalem, then into Judea and Samaria, and then into the ends of the earth that the gospel was to spread. And they were going to be witnesses, because remember, they had witnessed the resurrected Christ. So then we see the book of Acts giving us all these snapshots into the work that the apostles were doing. The book of Acts often demonstrates the work of the apostles in the first century of kingdom growth. And we can see, for example, the preaching of the first gospel sermon that declared the reign and authority of Jesus in Acts chapter 2. And it's the apostles who are preaching it, right? These 12 And we especially get some insight into Peter and his words there in Acts 2 as well. And then we're given details concerning the work of the Apostle Paul, who was sent on multiple preaching journeys that resulted in the gospel spreading and churches being established. And you really focus on the the work of the Apostle Paul and his journeys in Acts chapters 13 through 28 and all that he was doing is, as again, God is just giving us kind of these snapshots of how the gospel's spreading, but we see the apostles playing a critical role in taking the gospel throughout the world. Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. Paul wrote, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is, the church. I have become its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I labor for this, striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. So you can see Paul's role in all of this. Now, although the apostles played a very critical role in the growth of God's kingdom, and we see that again throughout the New Testament, but we must conclude that there are no longer apostles living on earth today. For an example, as an apostle had to be an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ, there are none living today who could possibly qualify However, these apostles of the past, though they, they are no longer truly apostles in this specific way today, these apostles of the past do continue to influence the growth of God's kingdom today. They continue to impact us. They continue to affect us. For it was the apostles who would have the truth revealed to them by the Holy Spirit and then who wrote much of the New Testament. In John chapter 16, Jesus told the apostles, verses 12 through 15, I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. 
Everything the Father has is mine. This is why I told you that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. So we can see that Jesus had promised that the Spirit would come upon the apostles. Same thing we saw back in Acts chapter 1. They were told to wait for the the baptism of the Holy Spirit there in Jerusalem. And the Spirit would guide them into all truth. They would remember what Jesus had said while he was with them. And still, then the Spirit would reveal things they weren't ready to hear yet at this time. In Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19, when Jesus tells Peter that, on this rock that is on the confession of his faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. And so the idea um, is that you know, the apostles were going to be the ones who would receive the words of God and share it with others. And what had been bound in heaven, what God had said, would be then bound here upon the earth, would be taught as truth. And God was using the apostles in a very crucial and instrumental way in doing all of this. And now we have their words um, in much of the New Testament. And thus, the apostles are a crucial piece to the foundation of the church. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20 says, So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. And so we recognize that the apostles are this crucial piece in the foundation of the church and continue to do so much today, not because we have apostles walking about the earth, but because of their work that has been done and the revelation of truth that we have uh, through them, um, their words as revealed through the Holy Spirit that are written in the pages of the Scriptures. So we've got apostles, that's one role. But then as we think about another role there in Ephesians chapter 4, we saw the role of prophets. Now, the term prophet refers to one who is an inspired messenger of God. Think about a mouthpiece for God on this earth. That is, this is not one who would just speak um, what they could read in the Bible, uh, but this is one who would be directly inspired to speak God's Word, sometimes in future events Um, that this was true, that it would sometimes include foretelling future events. But that's not all. We see prophets working in the Scriptures that it was just a message revealed through the prophet. It, It wasn't always a foretelling of future events. In New Testament times, the gift of prophecy was one of the miraculous gifts uh, given through the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11 talks about these various miraculous gifts, and in this list, we can see in, um, in verse 10 how some would be given this gift of prophecy through the Spirit. So these miraculous gifts that were given, how did they get them? Well, the Scriptures are very clear that these miraculous gifts, including prophecy, would be given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 19, we have Peter and John being sent to Samaria. There were people who had received the word of God in that area. And they went down there and prayed for them so that the Samaritans might receive the Holy Spirit because he had not yet come down on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. So, And there are other scriptures as well that show the same point, that it resulted from the laying on of the apostles' hands that these miraculous gifts uh, would be received. Now, 
while all the miraculous gifts of the Spirit were significant during New Testament times, they, for example, confirmed the word spoken was from God. You know, how would you know? You couldn't just go and read in the book of Acts and find out the answer. They, did, they didn't have that yet. It was still being written. Well, these gifts were used to confirm the, that the one who is speaking was really speaking the words of God. The gift of prophecy was especially important in that prophets would be used to reveal the truth from God. Let's read, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 5, we see how this gift was used in uh, New Testament times. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 through 5. Paul told these Christians, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, and especially that you may prophesy. For the person who speaks in a tongue is not speaking to people but to God, since no one understands him. He speaks mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the person who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and consolation. The person who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. I wish all of you spoke in tongues, but even more that you prophesied. The person who prophesies is greater than the one who the, the person who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may be built up. And so just recognize that the gift of prophecy was very important in the life of the first century church because God needed to reveal the truth to these individuals. And how would he do that? Well, he would use these prophets. They didn't have the completed New Testament yet to read what the will of God was. Particularly in both Ephesians 4 verse 11, as we read earlier, and 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 28, we see that prophets are listed second after apostles. God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets. It shows the same order in Ephesians chapter 4 concerning the apostles and prophets. So prophets helped people to know God's word. You think about among a lo uh, local churches and how they couldn't come together in their assemblies and read from the New Testament because it wasn't completed yet. But yet we see prophets among the local church. Acts 13 and in verse 1, we see in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, to go back to that particular text, it demonstrates how prophets would speak during the assemblies of the church. Let's start in verse 26. What then, brothers and sisters, whenever you come together, each one has a hymn, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything is to be done for building up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, there are only there are to be only two, or at most three, each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no interpreter, that person is to keep silent in the church and to speak to himself and God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should evaluate. But if something has been revealed to another person sitting there, the first prophet should be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that everyone may learn and everyone may be encouraged. And the prophet's spirits are subject to the prophets, since God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. So you can just kind of see how prophets functioned in the assemblies of a local church and how they would reveal the will of God to that congregation. And so you can see where this miraculous gift and this role was very critical during this particular time. Now notice they had control over the use of their miraculous gifts. They could choose to be silent and, and so forth here, as we can see in this particular text, and they weren't all to be speaking at one time, and there was a limit on how many and, and different things like that in this text, but just notice how important this gift would be. However, this gift would also be helpful in teaching outside the assemblies of the church as well. We see that women could also prophesy. We have an example of that in Acts chapter 21 and verse 9 where women are referred to as prophets, 
But we see even in this passage in 1 Corinthians 14 that that was restricted as far as the assemblies of the church goes. It talks about how, as in all the churches of the saints, the women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to submit themselves, as the law also says. If they want to learn something, let them ask for their own ask their own husbands at home, since it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. So in this time, the church comes together, which is the whole context here. Even if a woman could prophesy, she was not to use that gift during the assembling. Now, although the prophets played a critical role in the growth of God's kingdom, we must also conclude that they are, there are no longer prophets living on earth today. For example, as this was a miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit that was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, as we've seen, these gifts cannot continue to be passed on when those who had the ability to pass them on have long since died. Again, we saw that it took the laying on of the apostles' hands to give these miraculous gifts of the Spirit, which includes the gift of prophecy. Well, since the apostles have died, no one now can lay hands on anyone to continue these gifts. Furthermore, the need for this miraculous gift has also ended. Namely, these miraculous gifts, including prophecy, they were partial revelations of God's will. And they would cease when the perfect would come. Let's read in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 13. It says, Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And so we can see how these prophecies would come to an end. When would they come to an end? Well, verse, um, verse 10 says that when the perfect comes, the partial would come to an end. When those prophets would prophesy, they would reveal a part of God's revelation. Today, the full and perfect revelation of God's will to mankind has come. Today, we have the completed revelation of God's will in the New Testament. Jude 1 and in verse 3 tells us that we are to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. So it is complete. James 1, verse 25, But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. God's word is the perfect law of freedom, and now we have the whole completed New Testament and the completed will of God. So, as some of the New Testament writings came through the prophets, in addition to the apostles, they also, though, continue to have an impact on the growth of God's kingdom today. Even though we don't have prophets living on this earth today, despite the claims of some, the prophets of the past still continue to have an impact on God's kingdom. We still have some of their writings that help us to understand the will of God. Ephesians 3, verses 3 through 6, Paul wrote, the, the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have briefly written above. By reading this, you are able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. This was not 
made known to people in other generations as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body, and partners in the prophets in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And so the prophets were so helpful in revealing God's will and helping the church in its infancy in the kingdom of God to grow and to mature through that time. And thus, just like we saw with the apostles, the prophets also serve as a crucial piece to the foundation of the church. Again, the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. So, we have seen that God has set various roles in place in his church, in his kingdom, so as to help his kingdom grow. These roles have included the work of apostles and prophets in the past. They continue to be useful in the growth of God's kingdom today through the inspired words of God they have written. Through these roles, God uses people to help his word accomplish what he intends for it to do.